Welcome to the First Down Legacy Podcast, your gateway to the exciting world of multifamily real estate investing. If you're eager to discover the strategies, insights, and success stories that will take your investment game to the next level, you've come to the right place. In each episode, we delve deep into the multifamily investing arena, sharing expert advice, interviews with industry leaders, and valuable tips to help you build your own legacy through multifamily real estate. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, our podcast is your playbook for scoring big in the world of multifamily family investing. Join us as we explore the ins and outs of multifamily properties, uncover the latest market trends, and learn from those who have already achieved remarkable success in this dynamic field. Get ready to huddle up and tackle multifamily investing like a pro. This is the First Down Legacy Podcast, where your journey towards financial prosperity begins. Let's get started. Welcome to the First Down Legacy Podcast. It's it's an honor to have you. Uh, where, Where are you residing from? Uh, I'm currently in Ontario, Canada, uh, just outside of Toronto. Just outside of Toronto. Okay, amazing. How long have you uh, lived there for? Uh, So I was born and raised in Canada. Um, I lived here till I was about 19 years old, and that's when I started to to play professionally abroad in Europe. Um, Currently 32. I just moved back uh, two months ago. Amazing. Yes, let's talk about a little bit about that. Professional soccer player. You played for the national team as well? Uh, For the national futsal team. Futsal team. Okay, can you tell me a little bit more about futsal? I, I don't, I don't believe that I'm uh, I, that I know what that is. Uh, futsal is like five aside, so it's um, it's like indoor, the indoor game. Okay, indoor. Yes, I'm I'm familiar with indoor soccer. Wow, that's amazing. What what a journey there. Um, talk to me a little bit about how you got started in that. You know, as a as a child, as a teenager, and, and how how was your uh, journey able to develop in that area? Um, so I was always like a multi sport athlete growing up. Uh, I have an older brother, so it was really easy to like get into sports and be competitive. And then when I was about 13, I decided I want to be a soccer player. And I just dedicated all my time, like mornings, before school, after school, during lunch hours, um, finding alternative ways to train on my own. And then when I hit 19, I signed my first contract in Switzerland. And... I think after my second year there and I came back, um, we had like tryouts for for the futsal national team, which is five aside. And um, the coach saw me playing one day when I was in Toronto uh, with some friends that are all males. And he said, hey, listen, like we've we've got this team and we, we like your potential and come try out the sport. And I'm like, "Okay, cool. And I think we had about 168 girls at trainings and then we also had obviously girls from other provinces train and then I, I was one of the uh the players chosen for the 2013 world cup in uh, colombia wow that's amazing what a journey uh you know i, I personally don't know any um national <laughs> national players in, in in any sport so you know, it's an honor to have you here on the First Down Legacy podcast. I think you might be the biggest celebrity we've had so far. <laughs> so you talk about you dedicated your time since the time you were 13 years old. What kind of uh, support team or, yeah, so, so support system did you have in order to uh, achieve such great things at a young age? Um, I think I went like in a, in a little bit of a different route than than most athletes because um, I didn't have a very supportive um, group around me. Um, um, well, my my dad was a, a former athlete and he loved like connecting with me playing basketball. So when I started to play soccer, it was like there was a disconnect and my mom's not a big athlete. So their support was more like keep it amateur keep your head on your shoulders, um, just have fun. And that wasn't me at all. It was more like, I need to be this. I need to do that. I need to, uh, to achieve more. Um, I was very ambitious at a young age. And, um, so my support system lacked, but I think that I, I relied like a lot on myself and that's what was, I was able to like take my, my playing to the next level just by, um, that willpower to succeed, needing to succeed and, um, being what I set out to be. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. You talk about, uh, relying on yourself. So a lot of people would call that, you know, doubling down self-belief, um, into what you believe in, obviously. So 
soccer or futsal has taken you different places all over the world. How has that traveling and experience translated to, to today? Um, it's basically been like the the pillar to like any success I'm going to have in the future. Um, so when I was 19, I was adamant about not just being um, a soccer player, but also being a lead in the in the sport in Canada. That was like my my overall global goal, if you want to call it that. Um, so I was I managed to play in five different countries. Um, every time I felt success, I kind of moved on because I I saw the best of a certain country. Um, so it was all about meeting different coaches, understanding different philosophies, different methods, different formations, playing in different positions, being in different cultures, eating different, having different habits, different trainings, um, you know, whether they're in the morning, the, the, the afternoon or the night. Um, my overall goal was I wanted to find what I liked the most about each place I played at and then understand and deliver something in, in Canada and Ontario of how I can give the best experiences I ever had and prepare players for their next steps, whether that's, you know, um, going to play professionally, going to university and college, um, whether that's not staying in the sport as a player, but being a coach, being a referee, um, taking different pathways and knowing that you can stay in the sport and love what you do and not necessarily be like a participant, but you're still part of the community. Because I think that was like, at that age when I was 19, I was realizing I felt there was only, you are either a professional player, college player, or a coach or a referee. Those are like the, the, the only options to be. And, you know, my mission I feel like is, is giving players different pathways, um, kind of being a coach that they can rely on, parents can rely on, and um, I guess speaking my truth because it's not really easy when you go to another country and don't speak the language and um, there's always going to be politics involved and there's like little details that people don't really prepare you for, um, especially like I was one of the first women from Canada to, to start playing abroad and it was kind of like unheard of. So when I started doing that, it was like, like, what are your experiences like what are the what are what kind of adversity are you going through and there was a lot of things that i experienced that i never in my life thought i would because it was just not how i grew up it's just not culturally what we do and it was shocking there was lots of different types of traumas that i went through and um you know i feel like i've i've changed myself a hundred times because you you live you learn you experience and then you kind of have to like pick yourself up and and just go again. Um, exactly. So you're no stranger to adversity and something that, uh, let's say, a universal language that you had in common to all those places that you traveled to was, you know, that soccer um, background. And, and that's something that you guys can all, again, have that that common and and be able to connect with each other. So if you don't mind me asking, how long has it been since you've hung up the cleats or are you currently still active um i was in a motorcycle accident in 2018 and it was um long-term effects because I, I herniated five discs in my back and it was um a very difficult situation for me um i played second division after that and i played uh island league and i've also played second division in spain for futsal um i'm feeling really healthy now and being back in Ontario, one of the opportunities I have might be working in um, as a player coach. Um, whether that's me playing like a full 90 minute game, don't know about that. Um, but um, I'm always trying to touch the ball when I'm coaching. I'm always, you know, on the move. And um, I would say the last time I played futsal was uh, this past year in, in Ibiza. So it's been recent. It, it's not like I'm done for like 100%, but it's just something that I know that I, I can't take to that, the, the high performance level that I had before. For sure. I mean, 2018, you herniated three discs. Um, 
again, no stranger to adversity. That's, uh, you know, I applaud you for that because uh, I know the mental toughness that it takes as an athlete to get back from an injury, of, especially of that caliber. It, it's not an easy road. It's not an easy task. So for that, I definitely apl- applaud you. So you talk about a uh, player coach. Um, are you are you going to stick to more a professional side of things or, uh, you know, look to coach um, like professional i'm sorry uh collegiate athletes uh, at, a, at a bigger school what, what do you see yourself there in the in the near future honestly i have like a lot of things on my life to-do list so coaching a university in in canada or in the u.s is on my bucket list of things i'd love to do um is it an immediate goal right now i wouldn't say immediate but it's something okay. you know, i i'm aspiring to do one day um I think that my biggest asset right now is working in more development um, with the youth teams because I don't see necessarily like pathways for the younger players. Okay. Um, I don't see like like a, a stable club that has like that pyramid scheme where, you know, this is the top team and every every age group's training more or less the same, like every team. I don't see that yet. And that's something that I think is important for any any successful club is to to have that like the plan. Like this is what, you know, our top eleven eleven aside team looks like. How can we reach that being, you know, U eighteen, U sixteen, U fourteen, U twelve, U ten and under. You know, yeah. with goal in mind. So I think first would be establishing myself at um, a club and then having the reins to implement that and be at training sessions with every team. And um, I just I just love to have that academy style where you know everyone in the club. I know it's hard to do. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, amazing. I mean, there's other uh, blueprints out there, right? Like Barcelona, and Real Madrid, how, how they have these academies, you say. Um, you know, already established and they've had for many years and it speaks to the level of success that they have today. So, you know, if you're looking to do that on the women's side um, in a place where, you know, it's not commonly found, I think you have something very innovative and yeah, man, it sounds, it sounds amazing. It sounds very inspirational that you want to be in a position to take the reins, but also give back um, and bridge that gap from, you know, from aside from the road that you had to take. Um, so fast forward, right, to today, um, you know, what what kind of um, business aspirations or I should say real estate aspirations have you begun to sought out? Um, so I know it was like really big when I was living in Ibiza. It was something that like the island um, was basically really into, I think, um, being around people always showing beautiful houses, beautiful villas, and the type of people that are coming. And um, I don't know if you know Ibiza very well, but it's um, kind of like an adult playground. So, (laughs) and um, I love the idea of like the type of people that go to Ibiza is a lot of athletes go there. Um, Yeah. And I've always been like a big event planner. So like kind of collaborating between the idea of bringing the right people to an island and then also creating like sporting events in collaboration seemed like a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it is. Um, again, with the connections that you've made all throughout the world, uh, and specifically in Ibiza, uh, you know, I'm sure there's something there, a play that can be done, whether that's, you know, being, um, a partner in operating a hotel or, owning your your rentals in that area like a small portfolio of rentals in that area to where again you're talking about uh designing and event planning um that you can go ahead and and implement those strategies that's amazing so to this day uh have you begun to um seek any real estate acquisitions like to to acquire any uh, real estate portfolio um i haven't done any like like research on getting a license or anything at the moment. Um, I do have a girlfriend in Toronto who's quite big in the real estate industry. And um, yeah. I'm always inspired by like what her and her partner do on a daily basis. Um, okay. It's definitely something that uh, obviously if you're, I think if you're well-spoken 
um, you're reliable, you take accountability and understand your clients. And um, it helps if you're a little tech savvy, being able to do like great videos and, um, uh, you know, have great properties to offer. Like, I think she does a great job at doing that. And it's something that I always thought, you know, it could be definitely be something that um, that I could get into. Okay, so is um is your friend is she a realtor or a broker? A uh, realtor. So her name's Katerina, and um, okay. she's out of Toronto. Amazing, awesome. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that in, in order to invest into real estate, you know, you don't necessarily need a license of some sort. So it's not like you have to change your profession to go. Um, or yeah, have a, a change in profession to go seek that. Um, you know, you can start with as little as residential units, duplexes, fourplexes, or you can partner into um, general partners uh, and seek down multifamily properties, which is like apartment complexes and, and um, senior living type of uh, properties. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think you're in the great path right now you you would just have to kind of identify what you would want to go after whether that's again short-term rentals and tourist areas you know like residential homes for long-term tenants or you know being able to partner with different individuals as far as uh being able to own a piece of that property um like a 200 unit apartment complex so just a little bit about that um so i'm currently a co-sponsor for a deal out in Greenville, South Carolina, and it's a 232 unit project. So it's uh, the purchase price is close to $42 million. So again, myself, I don't have the expertise nor knowledge to be able to acquire that property and uh, run it or operate it the way it needs to be, right? So 40, um, at that point, you're, you're buying a business um, so again, me personally, but I said like individually, I should say I don't have the um, the expertise or the background to be able to do that. So the only way that I was able to just become part of it is to partner with individuals who have already done such things in this space. Um, so yeah, so uh, just you know, just kind of throwing that out there to kind of like open your eyes. So like, okay, well, like well, what does that look like? What does that mean? So, for example, the individuals that I'm partnering with, uh, you know, they've been doing this type of deals for about four years now, uh, a little over four years. And they currently have over two hundred million dollars in assets under management, meaning uh, their whole real estate portfolio in the United States is an accumulation of that. Um, it's over it's over like two thousand units in total so you just imagine over the years you continue to acquire these properties but again that's what they do right um but if you're not looking to be uh such an active operator and learning how to run these businesses uh, in such form um you can always be a limited partner to where you do invest you know some of your some capital for an exchange of equity in that structure or in that particular property um and those are things that are happening you know that are happening all the time um so if you, you know, if you begin to connect with the right people and ask the right questions, there's no doubt in my mind that by the end of 2024, uh, you know, you would be a real estate investor. Okay, great. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, yeah, there's just a little breakdown uh, of kind of how I got started. Um, again, you know, so I'm an aspiring real estate investor. Um, but I use this platform here from the First Now Legacy podcast to, again, meet with former athletes, you know, great individuals like yourself from all over the world to kind of open the eyes into what is real estate investing. And like like you want to do with um, the women's soccer in Canada, um, and kind of bridge that gap. You know, essentially, um, I'm doing the same with connecting with individuals like yourself, Allison. Excuse the interruption, but I have a very important message for each and every one of you. If you've made it through the video this far, it could only mean that you are ready to take your multifamily career to the next level. If you book a call with me in the link below, I can show you step by step on how I've been able to create passive income, build a legacy I've always wanted, and turn my dreams into a reality. Book a call with me now, and I too can show you how to align your purpose through multifamily investing. Let's go. <laughs> so tell me, um, 
today in, in today's uh in 2024 what, what, what do you have planned or what have you you know penciled in as far as short-term goals for this year short-term goals um i journal every day um wow yeah uh and then um establishing my non-negotiables your non-negotiables okay what what is if you don't mind can you share a little bit about what those uh look like yeah so i'm still i'm still working on them um it's something that obviously just doesn't come overnight um i guess your non-negotiables are like um you can do them for a career you can do them for relationships you can do them for okay a lot of different things like for example a non-negotiable for me could be like um um not being held back um when i'm career driven so if i were to to have a friend a friendship with someone and i'm getting a lot of feedback from them like oh you're never around or oh you're never able to do this or that it's a non-negotiable for me for someone to like take my energy so if i'm career driven and they know that then the only space i hold for them is if they give me the the kind of thumbs up of like you're doing right you're 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 being ambitious like congratulations good job good luck but as soon as i start feeling like the energy vampire then i i'm going to pull away and protect my myself amazing yeah for sure um the negotiables i um i would refer them to as boundaries right because again you're 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 goal driven you're, you're on a mission to accomplish you know so, so many things in your life um and yeah, having those people that kind of suck at it. I mean, it doesn't make them bad people or just not your friends, right? But, but you're just on different paths at this moment that obviously uh, that don't align at, at that time. 100%. So a little bit about your journaling. Is this something that you've done uh, over over many years um, or is it something that you recently started? And how, how has that changed, um, you know, being able to achieve your goals? I started journaling when I was 19. So like when I started my journey playing soccer in Switzerland, um, I started first off being more like detail oriented. So just journaling about like my session plans that I was um, like working under. So anytime my team trained, I would write down what we were working on, what we did, what we learned, what I liked about the activity, what I didn't like. Um, and just like, you know, I would say they were about like a page long every day. Um, and then, okay. and then I stopped, I stopped journaling in, I think 2022. And I realized that there was a lot of, um, disconnect between myself and my ambitions and, um, my feelings. And so I realized that like, you know, after about a year and a bit, not, not journaling, I realized, you know, that was like a core thing about myself that I, you know, I had a habit and then I let the habit go and um, it was something that I really want to get back into because I do see a huge improvement as a person when you're journaling, when you're being accountable for what you want and who you want to be and are you continuously showing up for yourself. I think journaling is just that like like that reflection a lot of people need to have and I know personally for me because I like to overthink and it's just I've always been like that so having that space or that safe page to write and express myself where I don't need to bottle things up and, um, you know, feel the world's against me. I, uh, I find that I'm already more relaxed, more in control of my feelings, more, um, goal oriented. And I'm already seeing like small changes that, that provide me with the clarity that, you know, journaling is something that is needed in my day to day. Okay. You know, that's something that I've um, I've wanted to pick up. I began to do so, but I haven't done it uh, consistently. Um, but I do understand the, the benefits that it can have as far as bringing clarity to your day to day. And I find that sometimes where I need that, where as I'm trying to do so many things at one time and I feel like I'm being uh, productive and essentially I'm being counterproductive. Um, so, you know, just a little bit, you know, disclosing a little bit, a little vulnerability here as far as, um, you know, this is going to be live on, on the internet. So just want to want to be able to state that, that um, 
I too need to work in my accountability on, you know, doing such uh, exercises or, ha or having those habits to just bring clarity to the day to day. I think that's like a really good goal to have. Um, in my my experience, it's not easy to just all of the sudden go from one day to the next doing it. But it's just literally about making time in the day to pick up a pencil or a pen. Don't do it on your phone. Rule number one, don't do it on your phone. You need to physically do it. Um, but yeah, even if it's just like thinking of the day and writing down like a successful thing. Hey, this morning I made the bed. It could be as simple as that. It could be I went to the gym and I wasn't feeling good, but I did it. Simple as that. And okay. that feeling when you read, when you go back to like, you know, the following day and you read what you wrote yesterday, the feeling that you get of accomplishment just from doing something you didn't want to do or accomplishing something that you didn't think you could do, it changes the, the start of the day. And okay. I think that's something that like when you start off small, just doing going over basic things and then you can start kind of like seeing the light and seeing how like you feel immediately after doing them after like, I would say, what, what's the, was what it 21 days to make a habit? That's kind of how it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once you start getting that, um, that dopamine from, from the, the excitement of what you're achieving, then you can kind of, um, do it with more ease and go into more detail and start to like enjoy it and make it like a daily habit or ritual. Okay. So see, I had a, a different perspective to it. Um, but I like how you said, you know, you write down what you do during the day and then you reflect on it the next day. So my original approach was kind of like first thing in the morning, write down what you want to accomplish today and it's kind of hard to meet that just because you have so many obligations throughout the day um you know whether it's your job your you know your real estate business uh you know being a being a father being a husband whatever the case is um you know it doesn't fit into what you wrote down for the day so i'm gonna try that thank you allison for sure i'm, I'm gonna try on reflecting on 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 the day before to kind of see what I actually did and what I um, and what goals that I meet at least on a daily basis yeah so just to kind of clarify like what you're doing like having like your checklist essentially is what you would be making is what you're talking about right now right it's yeah yeah what I want to do in the day and the only um thing with that is if you don't achieve what you wanted to do that there's a difference of like looking at like going back and reflecting you look at what you did not do versus this is what i did and how i felt about doing it okay so you already right there have like a positive mind change because when you're talking about things that you want to do in in the future but then not accomplishing them you're going to get a negative feedback from yourself yep. when you go back into that journal and read that whereas if you're talking like like i said i made the bed today or today i took care of the kids or um, I managed to, to go to work. I showed up. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I sold something or I did this and I'm proud of it. And then the next day you read that, you're like, yeah, I did that. I feel good about that. And you're going to take that like feeling and you bring it into the start of your next day. Yeah, for sure. I, I could definitely already see the different, uh, the different, interpretation there already uh just from that mindset from the negative to now feeling rewarded for what you did do the previous day amazing so allison do you kind of have a following on instagram facebook you know where you still share some of your your glory days yeah sometimes i mean now it's more like coach related i just ran um, my first soccer tournament in in ontario um it's called the princess cup and we had about, I think we had almost, almost 58 players come out and it was organized really last minute, like maybe in two weeks. And we had, you know, it was an under 12 girls tournament with um, an under 15 side tournament as well for girls. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really great. You know, I, I, um, now, now that I'm, you know, that I'm listening to you and getting the bigger picture, I kind of like want to get an idea of how does those 
partnerships work? Um, like, are you funding them yourselves? Are you seeking sponsors? Are you like, you know, like again, seeking sponsors, like with the local, uh, the local college, the local pro uh, professional club? Like, yeah, I want to, I want to get an insight on that, um, on how you're able to put these things together. Yeah. So I think that like, because I'm, you know, I'm back in Ontario, but you know, um, I haven't had a, a large following from people in Canada for a long time because I haven't been here. A lot of the time when people go abroad and they do their own thing, you know, it's not that you're forgotten. Like I'm very well known in like the soccer community, but the the youth players don't know me. The families don't know me, right? Because again, soccer for women, like it's not really played on TV. It's just starting to get played on TV now. Um, okay. So my job coming back, it's um, I like to I like to prove myself. It's like you know that typical hero syndrome from an athlete of trying to like you know you know, be your best. Right. So for me, yeah, what I do best is that I, uh, I show by example. So, um, I put this, this tournament on, um, the goal of it wasn't to make money. You can make a lot of money in tournaments, of course. Um, I probably lost about $400 in making the tournament because I wanted to have everyone, you know, get jerseys. I wanted everyone to have a good time, have decent playing time. And, um, I gave out medals, MVP stuff. Um, it was just something that the experience had to had to be good. The experience was the most important. The of you course. Know, being yeah. able, being able to, to talk to parents, to talk to players, um, just to see the level again and um, you know, put my brand out there to start. And then sure. whatever comes out of that, you know, it's up to me to to work on, but um, I know that I have a lot of players and a lot of parents that know me now, and they're they're kind of waiting for my next move. Like, what do I do? Where do I go? Um, do I open up my own academy? Do I go to a club and do they follow me? And um, unfortunately, yeah. um, well, actually, I think it's in in a lot of places. Um, there's this rule called poaching where you can't ask a player to come with you to to a club or to an academy if they're already with a club right. um, but this was my way of saying hey i'm back um and i'm going to be hosting trainings i'm going to be hosting um tournaments and group things with no pressure to leave your club um obviously there are a lot of very fantastic clubs in ontario for for youth development and I'm not in competition. I'm in a line with them. So I want, you know, right. the idea yeah. is to work together, not against. Um, okay. And that's kind of like where I'm at right now. Amazing. Amazing. So I'm definitely interested into following your journey here. And, you know, um, as far as your real estate aspirations, I, I'd love to connect with you further down the line. Um, for the individuals who are, you know, just learning who Allison Lemon is, uh, can you tell us maybe one sentence about yourself and in the future for 2024 um that's a well, that's a hard hard question one sentence <laughs> yeah um going out there to make a difference um would probably be my my line of the year because i've been able to to do that in soccer i've done that in futsal i've done that in traveling and going coming over adversity and this is just my new chapter of being in Ontario at the moment. And um, let's see what kind of a difference I can make, whether that's as a coach, a mentor, you know, player coach, who knows? Um, you know, it's just whoever I'm in contact with, like, how can I make an impact in a positive way? Amazing. Well, thank you, Allison Lemon, for joining us today on the First Time Legacy podcast. I look forward to connecting with you, um, you know, just further down the road, following your journey, um, on Instagram, on Facebook. Uh, I'll make sure to give you a follow there. Um, and again, impressive. Uh, it, it was an honor to have you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Of course. Uh, I wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the First Down Legacy Podcast. We hope you've gained valuable insights and inspiration for your multifamily investing journey. Remember, your legacy in multifamily investing is within reach. Keep
Keep learning, keep growing, and keep building your success story. We look forward to having you back with us for more game-changing strategies and stories in the multifamily investing world. Until then, keep the momentum going and keep building that legacy. This is the First Down Legacy Podcast. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you on the next episode.